Hi folks, welcome to the lecture for 2.3. We're going to start talking about how to graph polynomial functions given different characteristics um, that show up in the equation uh, as well as um, finding some specific important points to help us graph it. So I'm going to go ahead and get started here. I have my video off today. Um, I am actually coming to y'all from my brother-in-law's house, and I'm not sure how strong his connection is, so I don't want to mess that up. Um, so I'm going to leave my video off today, but um, you should be able to hear me fine. All right, so we start off this section with a definition of polynomials. And um, I know that this thing in front of you looks super scary, but it's really not that bad once you break it down and understand what each of these things mean. So that's what I'm going to start with is just explaining what the heck this thing is that you're looking at right here. So let me get my pen ready. All right, so. Uh, if you'll notice, uh, throughout this definition here, you have these a sub n's. You've got a sub n, a sub n minus 1, plus dot, 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 down to a sub 2, a sub 1, and a sub 0. Okay, so um, let me go ahead and point this out too. You have x to the nth power, x to the n minus 1, x to the x squared, x to the understood first power. And actually, believe it or not, there is an x to the 0 power hanging on to the n there. However, x to the 0 power is 1. Um, and so that's just a sub 0 times 1, which is just a sub 0. That's why you don't see that. Okay, so all these n's and n minus 1's and all this garbledy goop that we're looking at here, all this is is a naming system. Um, we have infinitely many polynomial functions, and so we have to have a general way of describing what any polynomial function looks like. So I'm just going to give an example here of a polynomial function. So perhaps my polynomial function is um, 3x to the 4th minus uh, 6 sevenths x cubed plus uh, 11x squared minus uh, 2x plus 1. Okay, so I just made that up. And I'm going to go ahead and code this with the colors that I have up there. And then I'll actually, you'll probably start seeing what each of these things actually is in that definition or that general form up there. Okay, so n, I'm talking x to the nth or a sub n, n in this definition is just the degree of the polynomial. So in my example, my n is 4 because the highest exponent for my polynomial function is to the fourth power, the 4. So my n is 4. What that says about this definition is that this first term here, well, it's going to be the term for your, it's going to be your degreed term, so it's going to have the highest exponent in the polynomial, and the coefficient, so in my, in my uh, example here, my leading coefficient is 3, so 
in my example here, a sub n is 3. All that is saying is this is the coefficient that goes with the term that is the degree of the polynomial. So the n is the degree, so my coefficient, I just name that, generally speaking, a sub n. Well, the next power down, so if I go from my first term of my example, which n is 4, so my degree is 4, the next term down, if I have one that's immediately preceding it, it would be a 3. Well, 3 is n minus 1. So we call the next term here, the power of the variable has got to be 1 less than the power before it. And we name the coefficient with the power of the term. So for my example, n is 4, my next term down is going to be 3, which is 4 minus 1. And this can happen for as many terms as you have. If I had started at x to the 17th, then I'm going to have 17, 16, 15, 14, all the way down to an x of 1 with a coefficient generally called a sub 1. And then my final term will be my constant term, x sub x to the 0 power is just 1, so that goes away, and I'm just left with some value, a constant term. So all these n's, n minus 1's, this is just a naming system. So the a's are the coefficients with whatever term they go with, and they match the um, sub, I'm sorry, the, uh, the sub number matches whatever power that particular term is raised to. So we start with our highest one end, and we walk down, for standard form, we walk down one by one all the way to um, zero. So the other thing I'm going to point out about this definition is that none of your a's can equal 0, and a must be a rational real value. So, um, that's the definition of a polynomial function. Now, for the rest of the uh, lesson here, the section, we're going to look at how we start graphing these things. Um, so with this definition, when you go and you graph a polynomial function, it will always be what we call a smooth, continuous curve. Smooth meaning it's got no jagged edges. It doesn't have any vertices or actual points. Um, I, I take that back. You can have a curve that, like, for example, the highest or lowest point on the parabola is called a vertex. Um, that is not a hard point. So scratch what I just said about not having vertices. It just doesn't, it doesn't come to a hard point. It's always going to be a smooth curve. Continuous means that you will be able to draw the entire polynomial function without picking your pen up or your pencil off of the paper. So the two on the left here are both examples of smooth, continuous curves. This first example on the right is not a uh, polynomial function because it's not continuous. It breaks. This is actually a piecewise function. The next one is not a polynomial function because it comes to sharp points there. Um, so these are just characteristics of the polynomial function, visual characteristics of the polynomial function. Moving forward.
Okay. So the first thing we learn about with polynomial functions is their end behavior. And when we're talking about end behavior, we're talking about how the tail ends of these functions act. There are only four possibilities. You can either have, you can either have falls, uh, falls to the left, rises right. You can have rises left, falls right. You can have tails up, so rises left and right, or tails down, uh, falls left and right. Those are the only four options that you can have with the tail ends of your polynomial function. And we are going to discover how you can know these characteristics of the, or the characteristic of the end behavior of your function just by looking at the leading term of your polynomial. So, um, your book calls it the leading coefficient test. I, rename this particular test that you do because it's not just the coefficient of the leading term. That's where the leading comes from. It's always your leading term that you look at. And this is when it's in standard form. So starting with the highest degree and working its way all the way down. Um, it's not just the coefficient, but it's also the power of the term. So I just call it the leading term test. Okay. So um, there are two possibilities for your power. You can either have an odd power or you can have an even power. Um, I'm going to simplify this greatly for you. And you really only have to know two functions to know what's going to happen with the end behavior of a polynomial function and that is the line or a linear function and the parabola, the quadratic. So, um, let me just remind you that a line is of the form f of x equals x or y equals x. So, um, we have x raised to the first power here. Well, a line, if it's not horizontal or vertical, will either have a positive slope or it will have a negative slope. Um, so, I either have S of X equals and some positive x, because remember the slope is understood to be positive there. Or I can have f of x equals negative x, so some negatively sloped line. Notice that it's understood that x is raised to the first power with both of these. That is an odd power, and the reason that I am pointing that out is because every odd powered polynomial function follows this pattern. So, the two things that you have to look at are the power, so that tells you if it's odd or even, and you have to look at the sign of the coefficient. So, a positive odd is, go, is going to rise to the right and fall to the left. So I'll just tell you this first graph here, this is some graph of a cubic, and it's a positive cubic function. Now, it's more than just x cubed because it's transformed. It's moved from the um, 
it's moved from the origin. It's a little steeper in its in its uh, curve on the inside. But for all intents and purposes, it is some positive cubic function. And because the power is odd and the leading coefficient is positive, it follows the same exact in behavior as a positively sloped line. It falls left and rises right. So I could have a negatively sloped line that rises left and falls right. So what this says is if your leading coefficient is negative, and you have an odd power, you're always going to rise left and fall right. So this is some polynomial function. We, it might be, I don't know, f of x. This is not it because it's got a lot going on through there. But it could be uh, negative x to the seventh. So the reason I call it the leading term test is because you need the sign of the coefficient of the leading coefficient the sign of the leading coefficient gives you um, I'm sorry it gives you with with the odd ones the slope and with the even ones, the way it the parabola opens up. So the leading coefficient, um, the, you, you want to look at the sign. So positive is in the parent function, and and negative would be the opposite of that. And the even or oddness of the power is what determines if if you have one going one way, one going the other way, or both going in the same direction. So for example, if I were going to talk about the characteristics of in behavior for the second graph right, let me get a different color, right here, all I would need to know to be able to determine what happens with the tail ends of it is to know that it is some negative odd so that I know that it rises left and falls right. So it follows the same thing as the line. If you can just remember what happens with a positively sloped and a negatively sloped line, you're good with any of the odd powered polynomial functions. OK, moving to evens. So we have either tails up or tails down. And all you have to know about is the quadratic. So we either have a quadratic in its parent form of opening up. So that would be f of x equals positive x squared. Or we may have it opening down. And that would be f of x equals negative x squared. So once again, all you need to know is the sign of the leading coefficient. In this case, it's positive 1. And in this case, it's negative 1. So the sign determines opening up or down. The fact that it's even says both of the tails go up or both of the tails go down. All right. So they both go in the same direction with the evens. So with the odds, we have opposite directions for the tails. And for the evens, we have same directions. OK. 
Okay. So um, this third graph here would be some sort of quartic function. So like f of x equals x to the fourth. I know it's positive because they're opening up. I know what a quartic function looks like. It always makes a W shape. Um, so you really didn't, you didn't need to know that per se, but you would need to be able to look at a, an equation here and say, oh, this is a positive, meaning the sign of the coefficient. This is a positive even. I'm going to have tails up. The other one is a negative even. So maybe it's f of x equals negative x to the eighth or something. So what I would need to focus on is the fact that this is a negative even, which means tails down. So all you really have to know are the linear function and the quadratic function because they're going to follow the same pattern as those two functions. Okay. So, if you look at a picture of this particular function here, just to point out before we find the zeros of a function or even figure out what the zeros of a function are, I want to point out that this function would be considered for end behavior purposes, end behavior, this would be a negative even. The leading term is negative and my degree is even. What that means is it's going to follow the same thing as a negative quadratic, which means tails down. Okay, so hopefully that cleared up any questions you might have had about, um, about end behavior there. All right, so let's talk about the zeros of a polynomial function. This will be the second thing that you will find. I think it should be OES. Maybe not. Um, this is the second characteristic that you'll find when you're trying to graph these functions. Okay, so first of all, what are zeros of a polynomial? Okay, so a zero is the same thing as an x-intercept, also called a root, also called solutions. So it's whatever you get for x when you plug zero in for y. That's how you always find x-intercepts. No matter what kind of function it is, if you're looking for x-intercepts, which would be, in this case, zero and two, it's whatever you get when you plug in zero for y. That gives you an x-intercept because both of these points have a y-coordinate of zero. That's how you find your x-intercepts. This is important because you need to know where this crosses the x-axis. So let's um, calculate these zeros for this particular um, for this particular function. I'll just use this room down here that I have. My function is f of x equals negative x to the fourth plus 4x cubed minus 4x squared. Okay, so I'm trying to figure out what are the x-intercepts. I plug in 0 for y. So 0 equals 
negative x to the fourth plus 4x cubed minus 4x squared. And to solve this polynomial function, I need to factor it and use the zero product property. At least factor it down until I get to a quadratic, and then I can solve any quadratic using the quadratic formula. But um, I've absolutely got to factor this one to get going on it. So zero equals, I never like my leading term to be negative. Oh, before, oh yeah, we've already pointed out the end behavior. Never mind. So we already know that this is a negative even, which gives us tails down on the end behavior. Okay, back to factoring. I don't like my leading terms to be negative, so I'm going to factor that out. And they all have in common an x squared term. When I factor that out, I'm left with x squared minus 4x plus 4. Okay. And um, the trinomial inside the parentheses here will factor further. I'm looking for the factors of 4 that add to make negative 4, and that's negative 2 and negative 2. So continuing to factor this, I have 0 equals negative x squared, and then I have x minus 2 times x minus 2, which gives me 0 equals negative x squared times x minus 2 squared. Okay? And it's important that you know that x minus 2 times x minus 2 is x minus 2 squared because the next characteristic we talk about are, uh, is the multiplicity of the factor. So it's very important that you realize that. I have not figured out the x-intercepts yet because I haven't used my zero product property to completely solve this. The zero product property, just to refresh you, says if I'm multiplying things together, that equals zero, then I had to know that at least one of those things had to be zero. And that is because, hang on just a second, let me unlock the door. Hey, buddy. Okay, so I'm back. The um, and or b equals zero here. So um, the only way to multiply together and make zero is to multiply with zero. So that brings us back to our little factored form equaling zero here. This is something being multiplied by something else equaling zero. So I can apply the zero product property at this point and say, well, if that's true, then either negative x squared equals zero or x minus two squared equals zero. All right. So, to finish this off, I come back and I divide by negative 1 on both sides here to get x squared equals 0. Take the square root of both sides and I get x equals 0. Note this is now an x-intercept, which I call zeros. That's, that's what they're called here uh, with this problem. So take note, I have an x-intercept at x equals zero. So let me finish off the other one. Take the square root of both sides, and I get x minus 2 equals zero. Add 2, and x is 2. Note, I have an x-intercept right there at 2. So, 
that's how you find the x-intercepts of the polynomial function, is you literally solve the equation when you plug in 0 for y. So in our, in our original equation, I plug in 0 for y and solve for x. Now, you may, you may have a number of different ways to solve what you get for once you plug 0 in. You may have a, a cubic equation that you have to factor and use a zero product property. You may have a, a quadratic. You can use the quadratic formula. Maybe linear, which is nice and, well, it won't be just linear. You may have a, you'd have to factor first to get some linear factors out of there. But um, you need to be familiar with all of the methods of factoring to be able to do this. And if you are rusty on your factoring, there is prerequisite material in the uh, beginning of your textbook before chapter one, and there is a section covering just factoring. So I'm going to go ahead and move forward. Okay, so like I said, the multiplicities of zeros. Um, let me go back to, the, to our last uh, No, let me explain it first, and then we'll go back and look at that last problem we were on, um, because I think it will be uh, enlightening to us to see the multiplicity in zero of the zeros in action. Okay, so what is multiplicity of zeros? It's just how many times the factor shows up in the polynomial. So for example, if I have a polynomial function, maybe it looks like this. X times, once I factored it out, X minus 3 squared times X plus seven um, to the fifth. Uh, the multiplicity of each of these factors, this x is understood to be raised to the first, fact, first power, so it would have a multiplicity of one. This particular factor, x minus three, is squared, so it has a multiplicity of two. This factor, x plus 7, is raised to the fifth power, so it has a multiplicity of 5. So it's however many times that factor has been multiplied in to create the polynomial. All right. So <clears throat> all we have to know are three pieces of information. We have a factor with a multiplicity of 1. And that is going to, ha oh, by the way, what does multiplicity tell us? Let me, let me put you in on that before I start moving through these. It tells us how the graph crosses the x-axis. So, if you have a factor or at, at that particular zero, at that zero, okay. So it tells you how the graph crosses the x-axis at that particular zero, and we have three possibilities for that. We have a multiplicity of one, which is completely crosses. All we have to do is think about the line, f of x equals x, so f of x equals x to the understood first power, so that's a multiplicity of 1 there. And this thing completely crosses at the x-axis, just goes straight across. Any even factor, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, and so on, any even factor is going to follow the same tendency 
as the parent quadratic. And so the parent quadratic at the origin comes down, touches the x-axis, and turns the other way. We call this a touch and turn. Any other odd besides 1, so 3 and greater, is going to do what we call S's across. So we have to know what the basic cubic looks like, and it comes through like this. And we call that an S across the x-axis. So any odd power that is not 1 is going to S across. So if I were going to do a quick sketch, of this function that I made up at the top. I'm going to erase one of these graphs so that I have the graph to work on here. I'll just erase the line since it's an easy one to put back. And I'll use a different color so you don't get confused. Okay, so if I go and graph this, Let's see, this is, if, if I had this expanded in polynomial form, it would be a positive even because I have 5, 6, 7, 8. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 factors of x there. And it's positive. None of my first terms are negative. So this would be a positive even, which means tails up just like the positive quadratic. So I could go ahead and note that that thing's going to have tails up. I have a, let's see, I have x equals 0, x minus 3 equals 0, and x plus 7 equals 0. So here x equals 3 and x equals negative 7. It's already factored for me, so all I have to do is a zero product property there. I have zeros at negative 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I have zeros at 0, or a 0 at 0, and I have a 0 at 3. At negative 7, it has a multiplicity of 5, so that they, oh, by the way, tails up on this, just like the positive quadratic. At negative 7, that thing is going to S across because it's an odd that's not 1. Let me make this a little more accurate here with a tail. Oops. Okay. So it's going to come down here and do this little S across thing. And then at 0, I have a multiplicity of 2. I'm sorry, that's at 3. My bad. At um, 0, I have a multiplicity of 1, so it's going to go completely across. Oops, I'm heading the wrong way. There we go. So it completely crosses. And then at 3, there's a multiplicity of 2, so it's going to touch and turn. Okay, so now the only thing we don't have is the height in, of where that, where the vertices are, where we have maxes and mins. And that you get from your graphing calculator or you have to know how to do calculus to do that. So we'll just use our graphing calculator for maxes and mins in this class. All right, so I'm just going to erase this. And I'm going to put the information for a multiplicity of 1 back on there. It follows the same characteristics as a line. So it completely crosses at the x-axis. Let's go back and look at our last graph to better understand multiplicity. Okay, so when we, when we, um, 
factored this thing out before we did the zero product property. We see that our x at zero had a multiplicity of two. That is a touch and turn. So you can see it touched that and turned. And if we look at the other one, it also, our 0 at 2 also had a multiplicity of 2 because it was squared, so it also touched and turned at that particular 0. All right. We have another theorem, um, and it's pretty simple. It's actually pretty common sense, if you ask me. Um, all the intermediate value theorem says is that if you plug in some x value and you get a y value out on the function, and you plug in another x value and you get a y value out, on the function, if these two y values change signs, so like with when I plugged in A, I get some negative value for X here, I'm sorry, for Y, and if I plug in B, I get some positive Y out. If you change signs between your Y values, it means you had to cross the X axis. So all it's saying is there's some value between, there's some C value between your A and your B value on the X axis that is going to have a Y value of zero. In other words, it's going to be an X intercept. That's all the intermediate value theorem tells you. Um, so I'll just point out what they have written in your textbook here. If you plug in some A value and your F of A or your Y value there is less than zero and you plug in some B value and your F of B is greater than zero, so you've changed signs, then that means there has to be some C value that gives you a F of C value of zero. In other words, it has to lie on the X axis between those two points. Okay. Graphing the polynomial function. By the way, I just told you the turning points of those polynomial functions you have to have your graphing calculator for or you need calculus to be able to calculate that by hand. So we'll just use our calculators and estimate what those functions, uh, where those turning points are. Okay, so to graph a polynomial function, the first thing you want to do is determine the end behavior. The end behavior, like we stated earlier, is by the leading term test. The, you want, you need to know the sign of the coefficient. Of the leading coefficient. And you need to know even or odd power. The next thing you want to find out are the x-intercepts. How? You plug in 0 for y or for f of x and solve. Determine the multiplicities of zeros. How? Determine how many times the factor was multiplied in. So look at the polynomial in its factored form and take the power of each of the factors. So this is just the power of each factor. 
the y-intercept. The y-intercept's easy. You just plug in 0 for x. Much easier than finding the x-intercept. Turning points, use your calculator, and then you're going to sketch your graph. So I've got an example for us to look at. All right. So the end behavior. I look at my leading term. First, I want to make sure that this is in standard form, so in descending order of powers. I look at my leading term here and see this is it's x to the fourth which makes this a positive even, which means tails up, just like the positive quadratic. The x-intercepts are what I get when I plug in 0 for y, so 0 equals x to the fourth minus 6x cubed plus 9x squared. I factor it. Pull out that x squared, and I have x squared minus 6x plus 9. I can put that into the quadratic function. However, I know that that one factors, and it factors very simply. What are the factors of 9 that add to make negative 6? That's negative 3 and negative 3. So this is x minus 3 times x minus 3. 0 equals x squared times x minus 3 squared. The multiplicity. I have two distinct factors. Multiplicities are both two. So they're both going to be touch and turn at those zeros. So I need to apply the zero product property to those. So I have x squared equals zero and x minus three equals zero. x equals zero, x equals three. The so y-intercept is what you get when you plug in 0 for x, so f of 0 is 0 to the 4th minus 6 times 0 cubed plus 9 times 0 squared, which is just 0. Turning points we get from our calculator. So I'm going to show you how to sketch this graph. First thing I do is go and graph my x-intercepts. I have an x-intercept at 0, and I have an x-intercept at 3. Then I always put my end behavior on there. So I know that this thing is tails up. Now I look at my multiplicity and say, oh, well, each of these zeros has a multiplicity of 2. So I touch and turn, touch and turn. The only thing that I would need to go to my calculator for is that um, max, that uh, relative maximum right there. And unfortunately, I cannot go and show you the graphing calculator to show you how to get that because something's up with my collaborate here and it won't let me take you out to my desktop. Um, so I will look for a video on the TI 83 or 84 to show you how to calculate that exact maximum. But that's all. That's how you graph a polynomial function. Um, let me go ahead and show the last slide here. So don't forget, Unit 4 is 2.1, 2.2, and 2.3. We have now finished all of the lectures over that material. Your homework and quiz are due next Monday, March the 17th, which is St. Patrick's Day, uh, at 11.59 p.m. I suggest you try to get it done the weekend before so you can enjoy your St. Patrick's Day, unless you're celebrating St. Patrick's Day early. Um, quiz will be open in my math lab this coming Thursday on the 13th at 12 a.m. The next lecture will be tomorrow at 3 p.m., and it will be a quiz review. And do not forget that summer registration opened today for those of you who have completed early bird advising appointments. So that is all I have for you today. I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon and get to enjoy the sunshine a little bit. I'm going to go hang out with my nephew and ride four-wheelers. You all have a good day.